Congregation, I invite you to open your Bibles to page 1694, <clears throat> Acts 2, 42 to 47. This is the second in our series, Up, In, and Out. Today we're going to focus on the in. I'll also put it on screen right now, uh, but you can also look it up in your Bibles. And uh, with our word <coughs> open, <coughs> excuse me, with our Bibles open, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord God and Father, thank you for your holy word. Lord, inspire us, and Lord, and speak to us through the word that we read, but also through its proclamation. Bless us, Lord, and speak us in your name alone. In Jesus' name, amen. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were caught together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Okay. So I just want to recap where we're at with this up, in, and out. Last week, Norm preached on the up part. <clears throat> Sorry. And uh, he focused on a few key words and in our connection with Jesus. And that's our first priority connection. We need an upward connection first. But as we grow in fellowship with our up with Jesus, the vertical the man-to-God dimension, we also need to be devoted to the man-to-man relationship, fellowship with one another, the horizontal. Jesus was very much concerned about that. And note his prayer to us. The high priestly prayer, when he prayed for his disciples, but he also prayed for us. I'm just going to read that prayer. My prayer is not for them, that is the disciples alone, I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I in you. May they also be in us that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought together in complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as I, as you have loved me. Last week, Norm focused on the key words of our text. They devoted themselves to the teaching, to prayer. They devoted themselves to praising God, that upward connection. And today we're going to be looking at the horizontal connection. Now, when it comes to our faith, <clears throat> how do we express our faith to someone else? Well, I like the words that Peter uses. He says, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks, to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the folk hope that you have. And I can see the wound that individually, our one-on-one connection. But how do we do that? as a community of believers? How do we give an answer to our neighbors around us for the hope we have in the gospel in Jesus? Is our fellowship as believers attractive to others? Do we need to grow in fellowship with one another? To help you think of that, I'm going to do a little one act. And I'm going to set it up right now. And this act basically is, <clears throat> for me, it has a basis in a lot of truth. And 
I'm going to introduce you to the editor. The editor of the Skeptic News. And I happen to be Henry Wong, the reporter. And my editor gave me an assignment. And he said, Henry, I know that you come from a foreign country, and I know you've never been to church. I wanted you to check out what's happening on that church on the hill on Elgin Street. I want you to check it out. On South Street, sorry. I want you to check it out. There's always cars going there, and there's always people going there. And uh, I want you to go incognito and just find out what you can. Well, this is now the Henry Wong coming to his editor. I, editor, I know that you asked me to report on my findings to date. And I know you asked me to go to Maranatha because I've got no religious background at all. So you know I was very, very nervous about going there because I don't know what they do in those churches and, and everything else. So, but, and then I didn't know how, they, how I would be welcomed. Oh, you told me, you just tell them that you're church shopping, that you're just checking out the church. Just tell them the truth. Don't have to tell them that you're a reporter, but just tell them the truth. Well, you know, I, when I went to Maranatha that first time, <clears throat> I went through the back door. And I thought, okay, I came early enough. People were already coming. Went in the door. As soon as I opened the door, there was a couple that greeted me and said, Hi, welcome. How are you? Yeah, this is your first time to Maranatha? I said, yeah, yeah, it's my first time. And he said, oh. he said I'm, I'm just looking checking out this church. He said, oh, fine, you're welcome here. Okay, so I thought, okay, this is great. And they told me to go up the stairs, and, and then I went up the stairs, and I noticed that there were guards at the doors, and they had papers in their hands, and I thought, hmm, I guess they're checking me out. And, and then a friendly guy, I think his name was Clarence, and he said to me, oh, no, he said, that's no, fine, you can sit anywhere you like. And then I noticed that there was a stairs going up. Oh, I thought there must be a balcony. Maybe I can sneak up there and just be incognito up there. So I asked Clarence if I could go up the balcony. He said, yeah, yeah, go right, go right ahead, go up, up in the balcony. So I went up in the balcony, and I thought, I'd just hide in the corner because I figured there wouldn't be too many people sitting up there. But boy, was I mistaken. Anyway, <laughs> then the meeting started. And boy, was I surprised. They really like karaoke. They have all the words on the screen, and they, and they really sing very lively. And you know, their, their speaker, their leader, I think they call him a pastor. Well, he's very passionate, and he talks a lot about Jesus. Well, I didn't know who this Jesus was. So I checked it out, and I found out it's a guy that lived over 2,000 years ago. He said, Boy, they say he is alive, and everything is written in the book they follow, they call the Bible, which is also in front of us, in the pew. And they talk a lot about sin. Discovered it means the bad things. They even have a ritual for this, Jesus. They call it the Last Supper. They have bread and juice, but really, they, they call it blood and body. And Oh man, it kind of sounded, that kind of, it really made me wonder about this business. Really, all this religious mumbo-jumbo was very confusing to me. It was a turnoff for me, Mr. Editor. It really was. And, but anyway, but when I saw how convicted these people were, and their leader seems to be really passionate, and they really seem to care, and they seem to respect each other, yet there must be really something to this. I thought, after the service... We were all invited down into the gym and to have coffee, which I thought kind of nice. And that was a chance for me to connect with a few people. And I found out from them that they seemed to have programs for all ages, not only the little kids, the Sunday school kids, and the boys and the girls. And they have a youth thing, and they even have a midweek women's program where the women come together for coffee. And they have even a seniors group. Oh, and they have six staff persons and all these programs 
So I asked the obvious question, who pays for all this stuff? And I found out that they have a budget over half a million dollars a year. And then a number of people told me confidentially that they contribute over three to four thousand dollars a year just to be a member here. And there seems to be members, volunteers, a lot of people teaching Sunday school, serving coffers, ushers and greeters, even some guards, some guys in guarding the parking lot. And they even have fundraisers and they collect money for other countries and for the food bank. And on one wall they saw, I saw and they noticed they had pictures of missionaries that they support. And uh, what impressed me was there's all these kids, Mr. Heather. You won't believe all the kids going to this church. They have so many young families. And I found out many of, of the families send their kids to Christian primary and secondary school at their cost. And I'm thinking, how do they do it? They give so much money. And I noticed in the parking lot they have pretty decent cars. And no one looked like they were hurting financially. So when I saw what they were doing as a community, it left me wondering, what is it about this Jesus? There must be something more to this than all the confusing mumble-jumble religious stuff. Therefore, Mr. Editor, I'm asking you for an extension of my assignment so I can go back and check out more about this Jesus. I remember the first time a classmate of mine with a Russian background asked me to come with me to my church because he knows that the church I was going to had lots of cars going to it every Sunday and it seemed to be busy all the time. So he was curious and wondering what is really going on there? So how do I, and how do we bear witness? What do outsiders see about you and about us? Yes, we can understand that if we are to be Jesus followers, Jesus' disciples, we have to be connected with Jesus. But why is it also important that we grow in fellowship with each other as well? Why can't I do it on my own? Why ask me to put up with all these other people? Just let me grow on my spiritual connection with Jesus. I can spend time with the Lord. And I can grow in my upward connection. I can share the hope that I have in Jesus. Why bother with the church? It can be so off-putting, so judgmental, archaic, with all its rituals and traditions. The church is ancient and seems to be stuck in the dark ages. As Henry Wong said, a lot of mumbo-jumbo. I remember when I was dating, I'd get home from work on a Saturday afternoon, get all cleaned up and dressed up, and then my mom would make a comment, and she said, you know, Rick, what it was like when I was a young girl, and my sister and I, we were dating, and the boys would come. We'd dress up, we'd get our nicest dress, we'd have curl, put curls in our hair the night before, and we'd all be nicely dressed for them, and they'd come on their bicycles, and, and your dad would all have his hair parted nicely and slicked and all together, and we, we tried to look our best for each other. We wanted to be as attractive as we could for each other. So as a church, what is the best attraction? How do we attract people to find the living water? How can we be a community that finds favor with those outside of it? We want to be attractive, don't we? Does our fellowship and our actions speak louder than words? I think so. We are meant to be a body of Christ, a fellowship of believers that comes together to build each other up but also to be a positive witness to the hope that we have in Jesus. And if that is germane to our mission as a community of Jesus followers, then how can we do that well? Can you see that it is super important 
that we grow in, that we're devoted to fellowship with one another in order to be a community that will attract others. We can learn a lot from the early church and from the teachings of Paul that are instructive in understanding how we can continue to grow in fellowship with one another. Why? Because a community that is known to be good at fellowship enjoys the favor of the people around us. It attracts outsiders. Whereas a community in which there is a lot of bickering, controversy, and hypocrisy turns people off and people leave. So let's look at some observations that we can glean from the early Acts 2 church from our scripture lesson this morning. I've just highlighted a few words that come out of the text and we'll look at them more, a little bit more detail. They devoted themselves to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread. They were together and had everything in common. They gave to anyone who had need. They met together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together. Let's look at the first one. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Basically, they shared. They shared with each other. What does it mean that they had everything in common? They willingly shared to make sure everyone's needs were met. Possessions didn't mean much, but their fellowship was everything. They shared everything in common. They shared and no one was in need. So let's expand on that word, everything. And we use the lens of Romans 12, verses 3 and 8. For by the grace given to me, remember what Paul is referring to is, the grace in his own life of meeting Jesus at the last hour in a dramatic way to be converted and to be changed into an apostle, rather to be someone who was against the way and who now is a follower of the way and a leader in the way. So I, Paul, say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the grace that Jesus gave, that God has distributed to each one of you. So we've all been given grace. For just as each one of us has one body with many of us members, and these members do not have all the same function, we're all different. So in Christ, again, Jesus, the focus, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We are together in community. We have different gifts. Different gifts. According to the grace given to each one of us, if your gift is in prophesying, being able to explain the word of God, being able to proclaim it, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is in serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And you look at more gifts and expand that list. Administrative gifts, technical gifts, healing gifts, pastoral gifts, cooking, counseling. And you can add to the list. Each one of us have been empowered by gifts by our Savior Jesus. Yet we are different. And because we are, we complement each other. Really, it is more like one and one is a lot more than two. We are better together. We can work together for results. Secondly, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They met together. They fellowshiped in the temple courts. Hebrews 10 talks a little about that. It says, 
let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he that is Jesus who promised is faithful and let us consider how we may spur one another toward love and good deeds not giving up on meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching of course you the author is talking about Jesus' second return. So they met together. Thirdly, they ate together. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere heart, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. They enjoyed each other's hospitality in their homes, in small groups, and also as larger groups as we hope to also enjoy fellowship this after the service. We have a special treat because Brent and Kathy are celebrating their anniversary today, and so we're going to have some, we're going to eat cake together. So that's, we know Jesus attended weddings. We know Jesus visited in some homes of his disciples, and we know he visited in homes of synagogue rulers, Pharisees, and even tax collectors. Jesus also did not send away the crowds hungry. But he fed them. Luke 9, feeding 5,000. Matthew 15, feeding 4,000. They all ate and were satisfied. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus practiced what the Apostle James expressed. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If any one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. In Hebrews, we read this text. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. To angels. And Jesus says, if you do this to the least of one of these brothers and sisters of mine, you've done it unto me. So in one sense, you could say, if we show hospitality, may we sometimes show hospitality to Jesus himself. That's how close he is to that. So as a fellowship team, our fellowship goal for our church this year is to grow in our hospitality and care for each other in our church and in our homes and in our communities. Was the first church the Acts 2 church, successful? Were they attractive? Our text says they were devoted to the fellowship and that they enjoyed the favor of the wide community. Next week, Pastor Norm will expand on this as he focuses on the challenge of growing out. As you consider this morning's message, how about you? Are you focused on growing in fellowship with one another? What does it convict you to do as a member of the community of believers? How does it comfort you to know that you are in this community? And how does it challenge you to become more active, committed as a member of this community? Think about these things. Let's pray. And I invite you to join me in the prayer. Lord, help me to be in the spirit with my brother and sister as we are one in the Lord. Lord, help me to walk with my brother and my sister as we are one in the Lord. Lord, help me to work with my brother and my sister as we are one in the Lord. For all praise belongs to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who makes us one. Amen.